Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and thank you, Matteo and Florent and of course, Jean, uh, for inviting me to this uh, really interesting workshop and for actually you know, putting it together under such adversarial uh, circumstances. Now, uh, what I'd like to talk about today are two recent papers that we wrote together with Florent Jacala, uh, Marc Mizar, Gain Reeves, and Lenka Steborova. And, and the question or the problem that we wanted to look at in these, prob in these papers was the problem of, of data structure, okay? And so the, the key question we set out here to investigate was, you know, if you look at the data sets that are important in machine learning, like images, like, like natural language, games of Go, um, they all have a lot of structure. And indeed, if you train a neural network um, on, on these data sets, uh, your aim is usually to extract some of that structure and, and, and to exploit it for your downstream task. And while this works really well in practice, from a theoretical point of view, um, this process is only really poorly understood, okay? And so we started wondering whether and how we can analyze the impact that data has on learning in neural networks. Now, um, for concreteness in this talk, I'm going to focus on a setup where we have a supervised regression task, okay? So you're going to have samples with a high dimensional feature vector X and some, some label Y. And usually the assumption is that you draw a data set uh, IID from some unknown data distribution queue. Okay? And if you're working in statistics or in, computers or in, in computer science, usually your goal will be to, to derive some theorem. Okay? And uh, the goal is to derive this theorem while making the least possible amount of assumptions about the data distribution queue. Okay? So you want to make the most general statement regardless of what your data is. Now we sort of took a complementary view where we sort of said, okay, let's sacrifice some of that generality, but let's put in some structure into this data distribution. Let's, let's assume some generative model for our data that has some distinctive features and then see um, how these features affect learning. And the classical way of, of modeling data for learning is of course uh, the classic teacher-student setup that emanated from the statistical physics of disordered systems uh, sometimes in the 80s. And the idea is really simple, right? So you generate your inputs by making some IID draws from the normal distribution. And then you generate label for these inputs by feeding them through a random neural network that we're going to call the teacher. And whatever is her output for a given input, that's going to be the label of that input, right? And throughout this talk, we're going to be interested in these two layer teachers where you can write the, the output function like I did here at the bottom of the slide. Now, this is nice in the sense that it gives you some structure in the task that you're learning. It gives you some structure for the function that goes uh, from X to Y and in terms of the teacher features. And now you can analyze how these show up in learning. But what's somewhat lacking is the structure in the inputs, right? The IID Gaussian, so sort of by construction, they don't have structure. And so we wanted to go a little bit beyond this uh, traditional vanilla teacher student setup. And so what we proposed was uh, what we call the hidden manifold model. And the idea here is um, to generate data in a slightly different way. Again, starting from a random IID Gaussian variable, that's going to be a latent variable. And from this Gaussian noise, you generate an input by feeding this latent variable through a generative neural network. So for example, here I'm showing a deep convolutional GAN. And the idea of these generative networks is that they are trained on some data set. And then if you give them some noise as an input, they will generate, in this case, an image that looks a little bit like what they saw in the training set. But it's a new, uh, previously unseen, unseen example. So this is how we're going to get generate the inputs X. Now the labels Y, we're going to again take them from a teacher, only this time the teacher will not be applied to the input X, but the teacher will be a function of the latent variable C. Okay? And the intuition here again, is maybe best illustrated with images, we sort of thought, well, you know, for, for this image of a dog, for example, its class or its label, it doesn't really depend on every single pixel in that image, right? Uh, it depends on some higher level features, and in some sense, they might be better captured by the latent variables, right? If you think, for example, of a conditional GAN, in a conditional GAN, you tell the generator exactly the class of image that you want to have. So in that sense, the important information is really in this, uh, in this latent variable. The question is then, okay, can we still analyze, uh, say, for example, the dynamics of two-layer networks um, if data come from this generative model, this hidden manifold model? 
And sort of the, the, the quick answer here is, is yes, yes we can. And um, particularly here, I'm, I'm going to talk about two contributions that, that we made. One is that uh, a theorem, the Gaussian equivalence theorem, where we give sort of rigorous conditions on, on the weights of a single layer generator, um, such that we can, we can do an analysis. And the second one is, is uh, a contribution where we derive dynamical equations that tell you how the student evolves in time, in particular how its test accuracy evolves in time when it's trained on data coming from this model. So for the rest of the talk, I just want to take you through these, through these two points. Um, let's start with the, with the Gaussian equivalence uh, theorem. And to understand that, um, it's maybe good to go back a step and go back to this uh, classical teacher-student setup where inputs are just IID um, random inputs, okay? Now, if I say analyze, what I mean is I want to compute the, the test error or the prediction mean squared error at all times, okay? So in this vanilla teacher-student setup, you can write this prediction mean squared error like this. Um, it's for a given student. That's what you're trying to learn. That's the function you're going to fit. So it's a two-layer network in this case. And you want to know what's the mean mean squared error that this uh, student is going to make with respect to the teacher, right? That's the one that the two line that creates the data. Random weight, but it's fixed. Now this is a high dimensional input over the uh, inputs X, over these ID inputs X. Um, but you can simplify this average by realizing that the inputs actually only intervene in this formula through the dot product with the teacher and the student weights respectively, right? And we're going to call these uh, dot products lambda and nu, these are the pre-activations of your student and the teacher. And so you can replace this high dimensional average over the inputs with a low dimensional average over these pre-activations. Now, that's nice, but already it doesn't buy you so much um, because you still have this nonlinearity in the way there, okay? Let me just say at this point that um, these pre-activations, they're really the key random variables, not just for the online learning that we're going to talk later, but also if you want to look at batch learning, and so you want to do replicas, uh, they're, they're a really important object. And then Bruno later this afternoon will talk about, um, about the batch approach and the replicas in a similar model. Okay, so at this point, you want to make the average over lambdas and news. Now, how are we going to do this? Well, if the input's IID, there's actually a really nice simplification that takes place. And that's that the central limit theorem kicks in. And so the lambdas and the news, uh, they're jointly Gaussian. And so we're going to say that this model has a Gaussian equivalence property. Okay, the lambdas and news are jointly Gaussian. And so uh, Carl Friedrich here is going to be very happy, but we can be very happy too, because that simplifies the average instead of being a function of all the moments of the distribution of lambda and nu, it's only going to be a function of uh, the second moments of the distribution. And these are the order parameters that you often introduce in, in statistical physics to analyze the system. Now the problem becomes, you know, tracking the evolution of these order parameters in time, or finding settled points equation um, for these order parameters. Now that's the Gaussian equivalence property, okay? Now, what we found with this uh, Gaussian equivalence theorem is that a similar results also holds if your inputs come from a generative model, more precisely from a single layer generative model uh, that you can write like this, okay? So C again are the random latent variables that you use to create your inputs and then you feed them through this one layer neural network and you have the teacher acting on the latent variables to give you your label. Now, it's not immediately clear that the local variables, the local pre-activation that I'm writing here, are jointly Gaussian, right? For once, now the inputs have a non-trivial correlation because they're not ID variables anymore, they come from this generator. And secondly, now that the teacher is acting in a different space, it's acting on the latent random variables, you know, yes. um, the, you know it's, it's not quite clear that they are jointly Gaussian anymore. But however, we found um, that they're still sometimes Gaussian. And in particular, uh, we were able, in particular with the help of, of, of Gayle and Reeves, to prove the following theorem, okay? So let P be the distribution of the pair lambda and nu, and let P hat be a Gaussian distribution with the same first and second moments. And you can then define a, a scholar quantity, a distance between these two distributions, and you can show that this distribution, it scales um, as one over the square root of n, where n is the input dimension and n here is very large. So in other words, the distribution of lambdas and nus and their Gaussian distribution coincide. Now that's very nice because we saw before that um, them being Gaussian enables the analysis. Now let's look a little bit closer at, at what kind of terms actually intervene here in this, in this theorem. 
Uh, on the one hand, you have uh, the student weights and the teacher weights and the weights of the generator, which come in here. Those are the uh, matrices W, W tilde, and, and A. And you have two matrices M1 and M2, and they're basically related to the, the input correlations of the inputs that come out of your generator. Okay. So this, this Gaussian equivalence theorem is related to um, a series of, of related works that also look at sort of Gaussian approximations um, for real data. And it's, uh, in, the, in the paper, we actually discuss these relations in, in, in quite some detail, but it's really quite a rich literature. At this point, let me just maybe make two or three very brief comments. So um, there's one series of works uh, that also looks at, at, at white neural you know, networks with white hidden layers. And that has sort of similar Gaussian equivalence results using random matrix theory. Now, what these results then need is, because it's a random matrix theory result, is that the weights in the networks are random, or at least that they need very little for them from their random initial condition. Now, what's nice about our theorem here is that the weights of, of the student and the teacher and the generator, they come in directly in the theorem, so we don't need them to be random. And indeed, later we'll show that all of our results also hold if we pre-train the generator, for example, or the teacher. Another set of, of, of really nice results came from, from the work of Son May in the group of Andrea Montanari and the work of the group of Romain Pouillet uh, here in Paris, who also um, introduced, if you will, equivalent Gaussian models uh, for data. Now, that work is a little bit different in the sense that we're looking at these low dimensional projections of data, whereas they look at models where um, the generalization error or the quantities that you're interested in can be written as an integral over the spectrum. Okay, and so what they show is that these spectral densities of the real data and of certain Gaussian covariate models coincide. So that's another really promising, promising direction. But one, at least for us, doesn't straightforwardly follow uh, from the other. Now that's the theorem part, um, and that was for one layer generator. Okay, so now naturally the question becomes, okay, now what if I want to have a more complicated generator, right? What if I want to make it deep? Or what if, for example, in this uh, convolutional GAN, what if I want to have not just fully connected layers, but some you know, convolutional layers? Now, we don't have a theorem for this yet, but what we did was um, we said, well, okay, let's look at the following case. You generate your data by feeding your Gaussian data to this generator. And then you let the labels again come from, from a teacher acting on this latent variable. Now we're going to take a two layer student and we're going to train it on this data using SGD using online SGD in particular, where at each step of the gradient, of the algorithm, sorry, you take a previously unseen example that you generate from a uh, fresh and you use that to evaluate the gradient and to compute your weight update. And what you can do then, given the get, is you can derive a closed set of equations for the order parameters Q and R that track the dynamics of a two-layer student that's trained on data coming from this model. Um, in some sense, this is a generalization of some similar work of, of Sarden Sola and, and Biel and Schwartz in the 90s. I put the reference on some earlier slides. We did this kind of analysis, but in the vanilla teacher student case. So my inputs were IID and the teacher was acting on the inputs directly. Okay? And so what we did here was basically extend this type of analysis to um, a deep generator and the teacher acting on the latent variables. And now I don't want to go into, into too much detail of this, of this here. Let me just quickly say that basically the trick here is to rewrite the order parameters as an integral over the spectral density of your input input covariance, okay? And um, then you can derive equations of motion um, for these densities. And that gives you a, a closed set of equations uh, that you can iterate and that you can then compare to, to simulations of stochastic gradients, okay? And, and to give you an idea of what this comparison to the experiment looks like, let's go to the case where we know that the get holds, so where we know that the lambdas and the news are jointly Gaussian. That's the single layer fully connected generator. Okay, so there we have the get the theorem. Okay, and so we can now just take a neural network, put it in the computer, run it, and train it on this data. That's the solid lines. And we can integrate the equations on the other hand that I just showed you. And we can then compare the two to each other. Now, since in this case we know that the get holds because we have the theorem, we expect that the crosses and the lines actually overlap so that they give the same thing, that they agree. And indeed, uh, in the experiment, um, we found that this is true. 
And this is nice because the equations, they, you know, they're not just something that you can integrate, but um, this, the equations are also something that you can, you can use and analyze to, for example, predict the performance of two layer neural networks, okay? Um, again, so the time I'm not going to go too much into this, but here, this is just one example where you can use the ODEs to predict how the generalization of a student depends on the latent dimension of your data, right? What's maybe more interesting is uh, we then said, okay, let's just take a really powerful uh, generative network. In this case, a so-called normalizing flow. Now, this is a, a generative network that was tra uh, trained on, on cipher images. We use the real MVP model here from uh, Dean et al. And so you can see at the top half some cipher images, and in the bottom half, you can see some of the images that were generated by this generative model. Okay, it has some, you know, like six million parameters. It was pre-trained here, so the weights in the model have some really strong correlations. And again, we played the same game. We trained the student on, on this data, you know, using PyTorch, and we integrated the ODEs describing the dynamics of the student. And what we found is that indeed, um, the two agree really well. So in other words, we can now analyze the dynamics of shallow neural networks when inputs come from such a structured uh, pre-trained generative model. So in other words, the fact that the ODEs agree with the simulations here means that the Gaussian equivalence that we proved for deep, for single layer generators, uh, I'm sorry, also holds for these deeper architectures. So again, Carl Frieder is very, very happy. And uh, with that, I'd like to, like to finish this talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions uh, at the end of the session. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um... Uh, 